Hello, everybody, and welcome to our presentation today with Catherine Hondras. This is going to be our presentation on the 105th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Project. But before we get started, that, let me give you a little bit of information about our host. So Catherine Hondras is a missionary. She's now living in New Jersey, and her genealogical and historic research has become a passion when one New Year's resolution she led to a discovery of American revolutionary ancestors, and she now spends her days working for an apparel company in many evenings, researching her favorite regiment, the 105th Ohio. And as we talk about the 105th Ohio Volunteers, it's a project that she started because she was inspired by the discovery of a Civil War so soldier who served in this unit. And she's gonna go into a lot more detail it's a really great project. It's a really great idea. She's got some letters to share with you, some soldier profiles, and welcome, Catherine. Hey, thanks, Sandy. I'm really happy to be here to talk to everyone today about the 105th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Project, and I just want to thank you for taking your time to spend it with me to learn about this. I've been working on this project for about nine years now, and what I'm planning to cover in this presentation is how the project came into existence, what are the goals of the project, and then with the remaining time, I'm going to share a story of one of the soldiers, which is really the point of what the project is all about, is to discover and preserve these stories. So let's get started. How did the project come into existence? Well, back in December of 2012, I was putting together New Year's resolutions. And in most years I make one resolution and it's usually some version of, I need to lose weight. And I typically don't do as much as I should on that. But the end of 2012 was different for me. It probably had something to do with the fact that we'd gone through Hurricane Sandy here on the East coast of the US. And I, there was a lot of cleanup that had to be done both at home, my husband's business and at the place that I work. So, when you've got kind of go through something like that, it makes you step back and it makes you think about what are the things that are you doing? Are they important? How are you putting your time in? Are you doing things that are meaningful? So when I got to the end of that year, it, it didn't feel right to set another typical resolution that I wasn't going to work on. So at the end of 2012, I decided to set some goals that were more specific and more well-rounded. So in the area of family, I set a goal uh, to find out who this Civil War soldier was that my grandmother had talked to, my dad's mother. She would mention sometimes, we have a soldier that served in the Civil War, and me being young and, and not too thoughtful at that time, I hadn't thought to ask, who was he? What do you know about him? And she had passed on, and I had never asked those questions. So at the end of 2012, after a natural disaster, in a season for taking some personal stock and doing meaningful things, resolving to find out who our family's Civil War soldier was seemed like a good resolution to make and a better resolution to keep. So in the new year I began, my mom's handwritten notes gave me a great starting point. And I put in a few hours every week, keeping a three ring binder and printing out everything I thought might be pertinent. And gradually I came to understand more of my family's history. A couple months later, I came across WikiTree and I loved its idea of a universal family tree that everyone participates in and everyone can contribute to. So I started doing my recording in there. And honestly, it really didn't take too long. There's so many great resources out there. I found the name of the Civil War soldier that Graham had hinted at, and you can see his picture here. His name was Alonzo Chubb, and he served in the Civil War as a second lieutenant of Company D of the 105th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. I found over 70 different sources for him. And every time I found a little fact or a little record, every book, every news article, it helped me understand better a man who had really lived a very full life. And through the collaborative power of WikiTree, a third cousin living in California found me and shared with me photos from the family Bible, which I had never seen or probably never would have seen without WikiTree, and a copy of an original newspaper clipping of Alonzo's death. So that was really a wow moment, and it made me glad that I had started 
doing the work that I had in Wikitree. So here's a quick bio of Alonzo, and you can kind of see the main points here. He was born in Pittsford, Monroe County, New York in 1823. He was the member of an early pioneer family in Michigan. There's a bio of his father in an Ionia County, Michigan history, and you get the first glimpse of Alonzo and what he must have been like. And this is how it reads. It said, Alexander's two sons, Kelsey and Alonzo, walked all the way from Detroit to Stony Creek, traveling by the way of Ann Arbor and driving two cows and eight sheep with which the Chubbs made a pretty good start in the wilds of their new settlement. So think about that. This is an unsettled land, no roads, no highways, a 65 mile trip, two teenage boys and 10 livestock. Uh, fast forward 20 years and Alonzo is married and the father of three boys. He's moved to Painesville, Ohio, and he invented and patented a wood bending machine, which he was probably putting to good use in his wagon manufacture business. Then the Civil War begins. The Chubb family had abolitionist leanings. His father had been endorsed by the Signal of Liberty newspaper in his run for county treasurer. So perhaps it's not surprising that Alonzo Chubb, at age 38, left his wife and sons, enlisted into the 105th Ohio, and recruited the greater part of Company D. The 105th Ohio was mustered in on August 20th, 1862 at Cleveland, Ohio. Chubb was wounded at the regiment's first battle, the Battle of Perryville, on October 8th. Then, on January 21st, 1863, he was captured by the Confederates as a member of the forage train, along with 115 other men from the 105th. A few of the, a few of the captured men escaped, and most were promptly paroled. But the Confederate General Braxton Bragg had other plans for the three captured officers. Captain Byron Canfield, Albion Weingar Turgi, who was first lieutenant, of Company G and Second Lieutenant Alonzo Chubb. In a breach of military protocol, Bragg held these three Union officers as hostages and demanded the release of three Confederate civilians. The three officers were sent off to the Confederates' Atlanta prison and were later transferred to Libby Prison in Richmond. The regimental history of the 105th entitled The Story of a Thousand tells a story that shows Alonzo in full grace under pressure mode during this trying time of imprisonment. It reads, one of the amusing anecdotes of the war involving whiskey concerned Lieutenant Alonzo Chubb of Company D, 105th Ohio Infantry. The lieutenant was captured at Murfreesboro. Chubb, who did not always decline to partake of intoxicating beverages, had lost the two middle fingers of one hand. His favorite answer when asked to imbibe was to put his hand with only the first and little fingers on it beside a glass and say, only two fingers, if you please. The joke was always new and usually convulsing. On the way as prisoner from Atlanta to Richmond, Chubb and the others were under a genial Confederate captain who was so enamored with this joke of Chubb's that he got Lieutenant Chubb out at every station where they stopped long enough to visit a saloon to show the Yankee method of measuring a drink. About three and a half months later, in May of 1863, the three Union officers were released in the prisoner exchange. Returning to his regiment and soon back in the fray, Lieutenant Chubb was wounded a second time, this time in the head and neck at the Battle of Chickamauga in September of 1863. He resigned one month later on account of wounds and sickness, his health being broken. After his resignation, Alonzo Chubb and his family returned to his father back in Ionia County, Michigan. He went on to be a pioneer in Wexford County. He was a community leader, a Sunday school superintendent, a lawyer, a judge, a man known for his humor, his ability as a speaker, and especially for his kindness and generosity in helping others. In Alonzo Chubb, I had discovered a man of substance, and I have to admit, I was more than a little starstruck. So uh, the curse of genealogist is, of course, we are curious people. 
And I was curious because Alonzo had turned out to be such an interesting person. I wanted to know who were the other two people that he was imprisoned with, not just their names and dates and vital statistics, but who were they? What happened in their lives? What were they like? So I researched a little bit more. So the first person I researched was Captain Byron Canfield. Canfield was one of the men held prisoner with Tub, Chubb and Tourjay. And uh, this is what I found out about him. First, that he was brave and cool in the heat of battle. When a bullet struck him at the angle of the forehead and plowed a furrow along the parting of his hair, he picked up his hat, which the bullet had knocked off, turned to his first sergeant, who stood beside him, he pointed to the wood and said with the grain, hey, Muffet, do you see any brains? And his sergeant, who was apparently as much of a wag as he was, said, Lord, no, do you think I have a microscope? So uh, again, grace under fire. Uh, Canfield was dishonorably discharged from the service without any kind of trial or review on account of the forage train capture that had landed them all in the Confederate prison. When he heard the news while at Libby Prison that he had been dishonorably discharged, he was in despair and thought to take his own life. Meanwhile, the fellow officers back at the 105th formally protested his dismissal, going against their colonel and against their general, because they knew Canfield had followed orders with regard to the forage train. And even throughout his life, these friends continued to advocate on Canfield's behalf, persisting until the dishonorable discharge was lifted and posthumously overturned by an act of Congress. So that was Canfield. Now let's talk about Albion Weingard Tourget. Tourget served as a private before the 105th in the 27th New York Infantry. In the first Battle of Bull Run, during a retreat of the Federal Army, he was crushed between a gun carriage and an ambulance so seriously that he was discharged for disability. He came home and for a year he walked on crutches. During that time, the Federal Arms had met with more reverses. It was a disastrous year for the Union and he felt he must go back and serve his country. So he went on his crutches to the governor of Ohio and ask for a commission to re recruit a company. He walked to the executive mansion on his crutches and threw them away outside the door so the governor wouldn't see that he was unfit for duty. He got his commission as first lieutenant of Company G of the 105th and recruited the greater part of that company and took them to the front. Tershi is an all but forgotten but important and passionate important and passionate Victorian era civil rights activists. He litigated unsuccessfully for Homer Plessy in the famous segregation case, Plessy versus Ferguson before the Supreme Court. And he's credited with introducing the phrase colorblind justice. He was a radical Republican, a reconstructionist who authored A Fool's Errand and Bricks Without Straw, a lawyer, a judge, and a diplomat. All of these men, the disgraced and redeemed captain, the lifelong civil rights firebrand, and my two times pioneer Alonzo were complex, imperfect, and, and their lives were very interesting, and I was hooked. So as I thought and thought about them, I realized the stories of most of the soldiers of the 105th were probably not known and were probably not easily discoverable. So I purposed to research every last one of them. Now, every soldier has a story. Many of them went back to their farms or to their businesses and lived simple lives. Others were pioneers in the West. A few went back East. Some answered higher calls becoming philanthropists and preachers. Some suffered great tragedy and some experienced what we might today call PTSD. A handful had been elusive and I haven't uncovered their stories yet, but I think I will. Um, so for the next eight years, I went to work on building soldier stories and benefited from WikiTree collaboration. When 600 soldiers were completed, which was about a little bit more than the halfway mark, I felt confident enough to set up the WikiTree 105th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Project. And I think Alonzo Chubb, Byron Canfield, and LBN Tourget 
would approve. So the goals and structure of the project. So now that I've explained how the project began, let's talk about the goals. So first a bit about the regiment. The 105th Ohio was organized at Cleveland, mustered in for a term of three years, beginning on August 20th, 1862, under the command of Albert S. Hall. The regiment came from five counties in northeastern Ohio, namely Ashtabula, Giaga, Lake, Mahoning, and Trumbull. These counties comprised what had been known as the Northwestern Reserve of Connecticut in the days before Ohio statehood. A total of 1,099 men served in this regiment, 1,012 being original recruits and 87 joining along the way. A final accounting at the end of the war showed that 163 men transferred out to other regiments, 38 men were absent with cause, like being on a special assignment or being sick at the hospital. 229 men lost their lives, with 62 being killed in battle, 50 dying of wounds, 105 dying of disease, 10 dying while prisoners, and two drowning. 278 men resigned or were discharged for disability, and 36 men went missing. So after subtracting the transfers, the absences, the dead, the discharges for disability, and the missing from the original 1099, the number of men who mustered out with the regiment in the summer of 1865 was less than one third of those who entered. Only 355 men mustered out. Their service is well documented and some of their more famous events are the battles of Perryville, Chickamauga, Missionary Ridge, the Atlanta campaign and Sherman's March to the Sea, and they participated in the Grand Review at Washington at the end of the war. So we know the geography the soldiers came from. We know the aggregated statistics of the regiment. We know the battles, skirmishes, sieges, marches the regiment participated in. We know that by the time they got to Goldsboro, North Carolina, many of them were barefoot and without proper Union uniforms. Some were wearing Confederate uniforms and civilian clothing. So while we know all these facts about the regiment as a whole, we probably don't know much of anything about the men who served. What were they like personally? What happened in their lives? So the two goals of the project are pretty straightforward. They're to research the soldiers that served in the regiment, to find out who were their ancestors, their siblings, their descendants, and to discover and tell their stories so they are not forgotten. So in terms of the current status towards this goal, there's about 750 profiles currently set up. Uh, 550 are researched as far as I'm able to research them. And then there's 200 that have some information because if I discover something about someone along the way, I record it right then and there so I don't lose it. So there's about 353 that haven't been started at all. Um, so at the current pace, I think I'll probably have this completed in about 2028. But in some sense, I don't think it's ever completed because there's always more to learn. Um, there's new materials being digitized all the time. I come across historical societies that have great information to share. Private individuals have come forward and shared original documents with me that I don't think would have come to light without the kind of crowdsource platform that this is. So um, that's goal one. And then with regard to telling the part, um, telling the story so they're not forgotten, I think a little bit of this story happens all the time. Um, there's three kinds of categories. Sometimes I come across people who are really knowledgeable about their soldier and they take over their soldier's profile and they just do simply awesome things. A couple great examples of this are uh, Captain Henry Harrison Cummings and Colonel George Todd Pat Perkins. Um, the second type of people have documents or photos in their private collection and they're willing to share them, but they're not um, going to be the ones who actually put them on the soldier's profile. So I'm always grateful to be entrusted to do those kinds of things and share these precious archive documents or photos. Um, so some, some great examples are that are uh, actually the original Colonel of the regiment, Albert Hall, 
uh, Charles Radcliffe. I've had things from several family members and James H. Taylor, who's going to figure into the story later on. Um, and then the third and most frequent question I received is because I'm the profile owner, people say, are you related to me? And typically I'm not because I'm only related to Alonzo. But my response is always along, along the lines of, I don't have a family connection to you, but I do have a war connection. Let me explain and tell you about your soldier. So I was going through my email last night just to see how often that's happened. And that has happened 51 times so far since I started the project. And I think that's awesome because that's 51 stories that will be remembered. Um, and then the second goal is to just make for a complete repository of reference materials. And this is also kind of an idealistic goal, but I do collect information. I have pages that record relationships between the soldiers, marriages, they married a sister, their brother-in-laws, their father and son. Those things are recorded. And I have a page of reference materials, either where there's a direct link to an online repository of the material, or if a historical society or a state library or something has it, I provide all those links so that if someone else wants to do research, it's all there and available for them. So those are the two goals. So now let's talk about the story of Samuel Brooks and his pension. So I've got a timeline here just to help keep the dates straight and to set those in everybody's mind. So we've got Samuel Brooks, he enlists in 1862. He's wounded in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 1865, very close to the end of the war. He's discharged for disability. He gets a pension at $4 a month right after the war. And then four years later, his pension is dropped. And he spends 15 years trying to get his pension restored. There is a heart-wrenching letter from his wife, which I'm going to share with you. And then eventually his pension is re-examined and it goes before the U.S. Congress as a bill. So we'll talk about all of that. So let me start with a letter, um, a little bit about Samuel Brooks. He was the son of William and Electa Fellers Brooks, and he was said to have been born in a log cabin in Mentor Township, Ashtabula County, Ohio in 1842, when roads were scarce and wildcats were plentiful. He was one of seven children with four sisters and two brothers. After the, sister, after the Civil War, he married an Irish-born woman named Maria Dyer, and they had eight children, five girls, and three boys. So now I'm going to set the stage for the story, and I'm going to read a report from a Mr. Davis on the Committee for Pensions that accompanied Senate Bill Number 338 in 1885. And this is what it says. Samuel Brooks enlisted as a private in Company D, 105th Regiment, Ohio Volunteers, August 2nd, 1862, and was wounded at Fayetteville, North Carolina on March 16th, 1865, was discharged May 16th, 1865, was pensioned at $4 per month from November 21st, 1866, which pension was under the Arrears Act related back to May of 1865, and was dropped December 1st, 1870. This bill is for granting him a pension. Now, just a side note, the $4 in 1866, according to some online calculators, would be about $75 a month today. So continuing with the letter, the declaration of the claimant for a pension was made on November 16th, 1866. It recites generally that his wound was received at Fayetteville, North Carolina on March 1865 in the service and in the line of duty on or about the 16th day of March 1865, and particularly while on the skirmish line and entering the said town of Fayetteville, he was wounded by a musket ball from the rebels passing, passing through the left arm above the elbow and through the left breast superficially, etc. Upon this declaration, the testimony of two comrades, one of whom saw him shot and the other who knew the fact from seeing him two days before and after the wound was received and the company roll of the day reporting him absent wounded, the pension was granted for the date and sum above mentioned. The claimant is an illiterate man, unskilled in expression, which I find 
uh, just as another aside, I find that amazing that this man persisted 15 years and was able to do what he did to reclaim his pension. Um, so the claimant is an illiterate man, unskilled in expression, and the declaration for the pension was written by a person who, as the paper show, was the clerk of the probate judge before whom the attestation was made. The claimant drew his pension until December 1st, 1870, when he was dropped without notice or without the opportunity to answer or explain the attacks upon his character embodied in the report of Special Examiner McComb of the Pension Office, who under the date of October 15, 1870, stated three citizens of Painville, Painesville, Ohio, and late members of Company D, 105th Ohio Volunteers, informed him that the claimant had been on duty as guard, that he had called in and reported himself at camp, that the claimant was intoxicated at the time and was cautioned not to go away as the regiment was about to move, but not heeding the admonitions of his comrades, he went off and while away was wounded, that the report was general that the claimant was injured at a house of ill fame or a brothel. So that is how Samuel Brooks lost his pension. Okay, so there were four men um, besides Special Examiner McComb involved with the defamatory claim against Samuel Brooks, um, not three. Introducing the four, we have Francis, also known as Frank Webster. Uh, Frank was born in New York. He grew up in Madison Lake County, Ohio. He was a painter. And it's likely he never married as his mother was the beneficiary of his military pension. The second man was a, name, a man named Minor Allen. He was a railroad engineer. He was married by about 1870. And by about 1874, he and his family had relocated to California. In 1885, he was said to be living in San Rafael, Marin County, California. And we know that he had at least two sons and one daughter. The third man, Elman Grover, was a laborer. His first wife died young, possibly in childbirth. He married a second time in 1872 and later in life for a third time. He has no known children, and he appears to have lived his entire life in Lake County, Ohio. The fourth individual was James Taylor. James was the son of a tanner and leather merchant from Painesville. He, he wrote a letter to his father during the war, and the letter kind of gives you the impression that he was a very precise young man who kept close tabs on his belongings and incoming packages, and he's aware of what other people are getting and receiving. After the war, he first had a grocery stand that was destroyed by fire and later rebuilt. Then he succeeded his father in the tanning and leather business after his father passed away. Then he tried his hand at a hotel business, which ended disastrously, and his last known job was as an agent of an oil company. Taylor was pressed into service as a speaker at the 1892 reunion of the 105th, and he spoke eloquently of their impetus for service. This is what he said. He said, it's very pleasant to come to this county, and they were in Ashtabula for this particular reunion, to the home of Giddings and Wade. Now, if you don't know who Giddings and Wade are, they were two very prominent early abolitionists. Giddings represented Northeast Ohio in the U.S. House from 1838 to 1859, and Wade was Ohio's senator from 1851 to 1869. They were one of the main reasons that the Western Reserve of Ohio, that section of Ohio, was one of the most anti-slavery re regions of the country. Um, so going back to what Taylor said, he said, it's very pleasant to come to this county seat, to the home of Giddings and Wade, who stood almost alone in their time. Later, we put on the knapsacks, shouldered our musket, and started to stand up for the cause they had stood for so many years before. He, is, he was married and is known to have had one son and one daughter. So, well, I find uh, him eloquent and I find him a good businessman. I don't particularly like what he did to Samuel Brooks, but complex and, and a very real character. 
Anyway, all four, Webster, Allen, Grover, and Taylor, enlisted at privates in the 105th Ohio. And during the war, Taylor was promoted to Sergeant Major. They were all mustered out at the end of the war, serving the entire duration. So Special Examiner McComb, based on the claim that Samuel Brooks was not injured in the line of duty, fortified by the claims that he left the regiment when advised not to, that he was drunk, that he visited a brothel, that this claim was made by four witnesses. He advised that he should be stricken from the pension rolls, and he was. And that's how the 15-year quest by Samuel Brooks to find out why his pension had been dropped and to recover it began. One of the greatest obstacles in recovering the pension was that the testimonies of the four witnesses were sealed under the immunity of secrecy. So that made it difficult for Brooks to discover the exact dispersions against his character and the source or sources of the dispersion. He made frequent appeals with his attorney to be informed of the alleged facts and theories that the pension office had relied on in their opposition to restoring the pension. One other request was even directed to President Garfield, who was from that part of Ohio, but all of these appeals were without effect. Uh, these appeals included affidavits that Samuel Brooks and his attorney procured from other soldiers in the regiment. They were taken to different pension examiners, but the pension was not restored. So here's some of these um, affidavits. So we'll start with Private Thomas Bowen. He was a Welsh immigrant of Company A, and he was the only man who was with Brooks when he was bayoneted and shot. After the war, he worked as a coal miner in Shawnee, Perry County, Ohio, in the southeastern quadrant of the state. So here's his affidavit. He says, I was formerly a member of Company A, 105th Regiment, Ohio Volunteers, and well remember Samuel Brooks, the above named soldier who was a member of Company D, same regiment. Said Brooks was wounded in the left arm and breast on or about the 16th of March, 1865, while in performance of his duties at Fayetteville, North Carolina, under the following circumstances. To wit, he was on the detail to perform guard duty in the town and was on duty most of the day. In the afternoon, I saw Brooks while passing on the street and stopped with him. When the troops had left the town, we did not receive information of it for some time, not until they had all gotten outside the town. We were then notified by our sergeant to report to our companies, and we immediately started to comply. On the way, we met five men dressed in citizens' clothes and armed. They endeavored to stop us, but we would not halt. One of them charged bayonet on Brooks, and in the scuffle, another one fired, wounding him as above stated. I did not see Brooks again until we reached the regiment. Brooks was, Brooks was not stationed at a house of ill fame, nor did neither he or I visit such a house during the time I was with him. Neither of us had anything to drink during the day. The shooting was in no manner the fault of Brooks. We were on our way to join the companies of which we were members. I was the only man with him when he was shot. Another individual who testified for him was the sergeant, Sergeant Marshall Teachout of Company D. He had worked as a clerk in McMinnville, Tennessee, immediately following the war for about eight years. Then he moved to White Cloud, Nuevo County, Michigan, and worked as a river foreman on the White River. This is his affidavit. I was formerly Sergeant Company D, 105th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and remember Samuel Brooks, who was a member of the same company and regiment. When our right arrived at Fayetteville, North Carolina, on or about the 16th of March, 1865, it was detailed, or at least a portion of it, to guard the place. And our major was the acting provost marshal. Brooks was one of the detail and was on guard a large portion of the day. I was in charge of the guard in that portion of the town. While on guard, Brooks was wounded in the left arm by who I do not know. He did not leave Fayetteville with the company, but my recollection is that when he came to it, just as it was about to start, he was then wounded. He was not intoxicated, and if any person stated that he was wounded at a house of ill fame, it was certainly a matter of mere conjecture with him. And then finally, the captain, uh, Captain Reuben G. Morgaridge, a clothing and furnishing stores owner at Titusville, Erie County, Pennsylvania, captain of the claimant's company, testified, was with the company at Fayetteville, North Carolina. The claimant was with the company and at Fayetteville. 
that when the army was there, the 105th Infantry was detailed to guard the town and my company with the rest, and the claimant went on duty with the rest of the company. In order to better guard the town, it was decided to divide it into districts, which was done, one company being signed to each district. Guards were then placed at such places in the town as would preserve order and protect property. In many instances, guards were stationed at private houses. Claimant went on duty with the rest of the company, and while on said guard duty or before he rejoined his company, he was wounded. I was not present when the claimant received his wound and did not see him when he was shot, but do know that he went on duty with the rest of the company and that he, when he returned, he was wounded. I would further say when the army moved out of Fayetteville towards Goldsboro, North Carolina, the 105th Ohio Volunteer Infantry remained on duty in the town until the army trains had all moved out said regiment covering the extreme rear of the army. I would further state that the claimant was a brave soldier and did his full duty as a soldier while in my company and under my command. The truth of the above statements I can personally certify to because I was personally knowing of them. So three pretty strong affidavits. Other affidavits were of claim obtained from Private Orrin Snedeker, a paper mill worker at Chagrin Falls, Private Reuben M. Simmons, a carpenter at Union City, Branch County, Michigan. So you can imagine the time it took, given the resources of finding people and looking things up in those days, to track down these former soldiers, to contact them, and to obtain their sworn testimonies in the various distant places that he lived that they all lived. Finally, in 1884, 14 years after Samuel lost his pension, Maria Dyer Brooks, his wife, was frustrated by the lack of progress and she wrote directly to the commissioner of pensions, a man named William Wade Dudley, and asked for the restoration of her husband's pension. You can deduce from the letter that Maria is now aware of the nature of the secret accusations made against her husband. The pension committee's assessment of her letter later on was that it was written by an honest wife and mother to whom the pension is much more for the comforts it would bring, but to whom it would be vastly more as the seal and pledge of the husband's honor and the family's good name. Her letter reads as follows, and her frustration is just so loud in this. Mr. W.W. W. Dudley, and this is February 16th, 1884, sir. I thought I would take the liberty of dropping you a few lines myself, seeing that you did not answer my husband's letter. Now this talk about him, it's all false, for I have known him from a boy up, Mr. Dudley, sir. I think it's a poor excuse to believe false stories. I think he ought to have his pension. I think he has sent in sufficient proof and good responsible men. You know, the best of men have enemies. Now, if I could find out who those boys are, he would make them prove it. I wish you would let me know if you could. Samuel's health is very poor, and he cannot work as other men can. His wounds bother him dreadful bad. Oh, how they do pain him before a storm, and it's growing worse. My husband was a strong, healthy boy when he went into the army, and he has never had a day's good health since he came out. He has been a great distance to get his captains, affidavits, and others also. They have respected him enough to drop him a car to see if he redeemed his pension. If he was such a man as they say he was in the army, why would these businessmen be willing to help him? It has cost a great deal to go from one place to another. They live so far apart. They all seem to think he was a good boy in the service. But Mr. Dudley, he did not go in for money. He went in for his country, done his duty properly, never came home on a furlough, served almost three years until he got wounded, got an honorable discharge like a man. His parents and relations are good, respectable, and responsible people, and mine also. Now, Mr. Dudley, I have a weekly family to take care of and a sickly man and little to do it with. Now, Mr. Dudley, please let me know what further proof you want. It would help me a great deal, for I need it bad, for I think it is due to me. 
for he has lost both his health and wealth in the army. Now I hope to hear good news next time. This money is due to us if ferity is shown. No more at present. Write soon if you please, and let me know what you are going to do about this business. Very truly, Maria Brooks. So finally, in 1885, 15 years after Samuel Brooks was dropped from the pension roll, the pension board agrees to re-examine his case. At least four different special examiners, Keeney, Loomis, Parker, and Sweetser, each had a part in the review of the case. They reviewed the affidavits that were given by Thomas Bowen, Marshall Teachout, Orrin Snedeker, Reuben Sibbins, and Reuben Morgaridge, and in some cases, they interrogated those witnesses. In addition to reviewing the testimony, the special examiner's job was to record their assessment of the witness. Of Thomas Bowen, the soldier who testified about being with Brooks when he was bayoneted and shot, Parker wrote, Bowen is an ignorant man, but his story is told in a truthful manner, and I believe him. Captain Reuben Morgaridge did not so fare so well in Special Agent Loomis's opinion. He found him to be vacillating and uncertain, and inclined under the direction of leading questions by the examiner to give color to suggestion. His testimony as a whole, if it possesses any value, is in favor of the claimant. The special examiners also identified other possible witnesses. One of these other witnesses was Private Henry Scoville, a farmer of Ashtabula County. Here's Henry's testimony and the agent's assessment of Henry. The testimony declared that he, Henry Scoville, was on guard duty at a private house next to the one claimant Samuel Brooks was guarding, that he was relieved from duty just after the claimant was in order to report to his company at once that they were going to evacuate the city. So he took right down, he took on, he took right on down the street after the claimant, though on the other side, keeping in sight of him and one Bowen who was with him and saw them attacked by armed citizens and heard the firing. When the difficulty arose, the witness, quote, did not stop just then to make a close inspection of things, but got away from there pretty lively himself. And the next thing he saw of the claimant was when they found him at the pontoon bridge shot, wounded, that he was in the line of duty when wounded, when uh, he was not drunk or under the influence of liquor, he was not a drinking man and was going direct to his company when wounded. Special Examiner Keeney wrote of Henry Scoville, he said, this witness is a man of bad reputation for truth and veracity, but I was impressed with the details that he gave with the belief that he told the truth as near as he could recall the facts. His manner was fair and exhibited no bias or prejudices. Other new testimonies were sought from Private Samuel J. Potts and Losey Swartout. First Sergeant George L. Mason and Dr. John, John Turnbull. Dr. Turnbull's testimony was particularly valuable as the doctor had been the assistant surgeon of the 105th, was very well respected, and aspects of his testimony could be validated against the unit's medical logs. Here's an excerpt from what Special Examiner Sweetser wrote. When the opponent, Dr. Turnbull, found Brooks lying wounded, he was to all appearances perfectly sober. If he was not, he certainly would have known it. Soldier was not, to his knowledge, in the habit of drinking. He was a good soldier, no shirk and no coward, and always prompt in the performance of duty. And a surgeon very soon finds out who the shirks and cowards are. Statements given herein are from the record made on the morning sick report and the prescription book of the 105th Regiment and partly from memory also. He knew the soldier sufficiently well to know if he had been addicted to loose habits of any kind, believes him to have been in all respects a trustworthy, moral man, cannot say whether the soldier had any personal enemies. The new special examiners also tried to re-examine the four individuals whose testimony Special Examiner McComb had spoken to. McComb was dead. Francis Webster had died. 
Minor Allen had gone to California and could not be re-examined. The third accuser, Alman Grover, now testified in favor of Samuel Brooks. And this is what was written about him. Alman Grover, Unionville, Ohio, testifies that the claimant was, as he understood, wounded in the line of duty on his way to report to his company after being relieved from duty. Claimant did not, to the witness's knowledge, report to his company, get relieved and wander off and get wounded in a private quarrel, was not drunk or under the influence of whiskey, was a temperate man of peaceful disposition. This witness, it will be observed, was one of the parties purporting to have testified before Special Examiner McComb. He renounces that affidavit and makes a strong definition in favor of the claimant. Manner fair and unbiased, reputation good. Finally, there was James H. Taylor before Special Examiner Keeney. Of him, Keeney wrote, this is another one of the witnesses seen by Special Agent McComb. And while Taylor is a man of good reputation, he has a bearing and manner in testifying, which impresses one with the belief that he is either telling a lie or not telling the whole truth. He goes square back on his affidavit to McComb, and now before me and in the presence of the claimant, he makes a deposition supporting the claim. He is against all pension and pensioners, and he's a chronic grumbler about them, as well as other things which do not coincide with his particular views. So two of the four original witnesses did not hold up under scrutiny 15 years later. And when the Committee on Pensions took a closer look at the original documents, they didn't hold up well to scrutiny either. The report to the Senate states, these four affidavits of persons living in three different towns in two states sworn at 27 dates apart were, as the original showed, written in the same hand, with the same ink and pen, on paper of the same water lining and texture, doubtless at the same time, covering identically the same facts, using the same and peculiar forms of expression. So they are on their face, not the unbiased testimony of honest men sorrowfully compelled in the justice of government to do injury to a comrade, but rather the coinage of a single brain, the work of a professional affidavit monger. The closing report the closing paragraph of the report to the Senate says, it's clear the soldier has been wrong and the bill directing his name to be put on the pension roll is amended to make such restoration relate back to the date it was dropped therefrom. And so amended, it was hereby reported back to the Senate with the recommendation that it do pass. So it ended well for Samuel Brooks, his pension, um, his pension was restored back from the time it had been dropped in 1870. Samuel lived until age 97, dying in the home of his son, Fred, in Mentor, Ohio. So this deed against Samuel Brooks, who conceived it, the Senate report thought it was the product of one individual. Which one? Why did the others go along? And well, it might make a more satisfying ending if we knew exactly who was responsible um, and if Francis Webster, Minor Allen, Alman Groveland, and James Harvey Taylor, and even Special Examiner McComb got their comeuppances for their role in depriving Samuel Brooks and the pension for so many years, in life it often doesn't work out that way. Minor Allen remained in California the rest of his day, and Alman Grover in Ohio. James Harvey Taylor continued in a few different lines of business, and probably experienced the dissatisfaction associated with being a lifelong grumber, grumbler and maybe for also being a great patriot. And McComb, he passed away, so we don't know. So that's the story of Samuel Brooks and his pension, which was, I think, just a gem of a find in the 105th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Project. So I hope you found this story interesting and maybe even a little more so interesting because we understand something about all the men who had a hand in it. So in closing, I do believe that there's a great richness that comes from studying a regiment as a whole versus studying one individual soldier. Because in a lot of source documents, when you find one, you find many of the others, and it gives you an idea of their personalities and their characters. 
Um, they served in the regiment together. They were neighbors of each other. They referred to each other in letters and diary entries, sometimes by last name only. And you have to do a little sleuthing to make sure of who it is you're talking about. Sometimes their children married or they married each other's sisters or widows. They traveled to visit each other and that would make the newspapers. They were in the GAR, Grand Army of the Republic, a veterans organization together. They held reunions. They visited battlefields together. And sadly, sometimes they were pallbearers for each other. So I recommend the study of a regiment. I never knew that I would find this kind of richness when I began this project. If you'd like to know more, I think that um, Sandy has shared the link to the regiment. And if you would like to find out more or be part of this project, I'd love to have the help. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And, and I do have time for a few questions if um, anyone would like to add them. We do have a couple of questions. Um, I know that some have kind of been answered by some fans that are in the chat. So let me, um, some, Michael asked what the honors the company were, were awarded, but I do know that somebody also mentioned that on the free space page, you have a list of that. But could you just quickly just give us a 20 second recap of what the honors might have been that were awarded to this group? Um, in terms of uh, military honors to the yes. group? Yes. Um, I, I know that I know the battles that they served in, which was uh, Perryville, Chickamauga, Missionary Ridge, um, Ringgold. Um, and I, I do have those listed there. They were uh they were associated with the acorn and the oak tree because they they stood so strong in the battles after originally being decimated at Perryville. Um, but other than that, I don't have uh, any specifics on um, awards from them, and I haven't found those kind of records. Okay, and then but we if, got a if someone has that. I would. I'm all for it. Well, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. And we have another comment from Blake, who's very interested in Samuel Brooks. So, oh, hi, and, Blake. <laughs> so it looks like you've got a fellow researcher here of that would be, regiment and of Samuel Brooks. That would be amazing. Now, I just want to spend a minute or so. I don't know if everybody knows this, but you also have something called right a soldier, a letter. Did I get that right? Oh, yes. Um, this is a project that my mom got me started on. Um, my grandfather worked in the duck plant in Pontiac, Michigan during World War II. And he started a club at the plant called the Right of Fighter Club. And during the war, he wrote to seven different soldiers and he kept all those letters. And uh, my, after he passed, my grandmother kept them. And then my mother inherited them and she gave them to me and asked if um, I would try to find the families of the soldiers that he wrote to and return the letters. So because Wikitree is crowdsourced and because a lot of people um, uh, come there, I thought, well, let me try to research these seven men as best I can. And um, let's put the profiles out there. So they've been out for a while and I've had some inquiries on them, but kind of an amazing thing happened um, about uh, maybe two months ago now. So uh, a lady named Janine from Sandy's Appalachia Projects found the, um, found the uh, uh, project and she said, this, I think this man, Albert DeWeese is from my county. And she took the information and posted it on a Facebook page for her county. And within hours, a niece of Albert DeWeese had spotted it. She contacted me and we had some conversations and I put the letters together with a picture of my grandfather's family because Albert DeWeese, DeWeese was alive at 102 years old. Wow. And the letters actually went home to the soldier who had written them. Now so, that's amazing to me that um, was awesome. that again talks about the collaboration of Wikitree. And I want to also really point out to everybody that 
Um, Catherine, when, when she created the 105th Project, this also speaks to the power of anybody that has such a passion or such a curiosity for a group of individuals or a town or an area, create a free space page. And that's what got this going. And because her free space page of the 105th is so awesome, it is so much information on it. And when you help her out, she even gives you a sample profiles way that she's documenting these individuals. Create a free space page if you two have the passion or the curiosity for something like this. And the 105th Regiment, it's a testament to their dedication of those very few that were left. So thank you for not only sharing this project, but creating it and giving this presentation because these are important things. We're talking about PTSD and things like that from the past when it wasn't a thing. Yeah, it's been amazing. And I have a lot more stories. If anyone's interested, I can point you to the best ones. So just reach out. I'm, I'm happy for any collaboration or to share um, any other information that I have. That's great. It, and if you look at the link I put up, Catherine's uh, profile. So just reach out to her. We've got a couple of things you can reach out to. Reach out to her if you're curious about helping her out enjoying because let's see if we can get this done before 2028. <laughs> also, if you want to hear some more stories, uh, maybe set up your own Zoom and start talking about the stories and sharing information, but also the right of soldier. So there's a lot of good stuff that Catherine's doing for us on WikiTree, and I encourage everybody, jump on in. Make sure to have some fun with it and, you know, research a soldier. Okay, it looks like all that's right. about all the questions. I can't thank you enough for this presentation. It was fascinating. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Don't forget to click like on the video that helps us out tremendously. This video will be up on Wikitree site indefinitely. So if you need to go back and reference or want to hear something again, feel free to do that. I am also going to post just a little bit of information about one of our exhibitors, because I think that this kind of relates to our topic. It's the One Place Studies exhibitor. So if you get a chance, visit them as well, because that's what the 105th was kind of doing. Like you said, they they knew each other. They married. They were pallbearers. They were a group. They were a one place group. So again, thank you all. And have a good evening. If you're not in the States, have a good morning. Thank you so much.